Listen, we only get one shot at this. Why not live life on our own terms? Hey everyone, it's Tom Kradza, and on this episode of the Your Life, Your Term show, we brought back Fernando Cipriano, and Fernando was on, I think, a couple months ago. Absolutely fantastic guy. We had a great chat then, had a great chat this time. We talk about the economy, the Canadian economy, the U.S. economy. We talk about investing. We talk about education and the future of education, and we talk about artificial intelligence. If you don't know Fernando, here's what you need to know about him. He started a firm. First of all, he worked for one of the Canada's rare billionaires back in the day. Then after working for that gentleman, he took off and started his own firm. That firm grew to over $1.5 billion in assets under control with over 17,000 investors around the world. So he has been in the investing and finance world for his whole life. He retired in 2014, never thought he'd go back into the world of finance until he got into artificial intelligence with his business partner, Makul Pal, and Eight was born. Eight is uh, some information you can find about Eight. It's an investment fund. We are not connected to them, so do your own due diligence, of course, like with any investing that you would ever do. Never believe anything we have to say. Always do your own due diligence diligence, but you can check out more about eight at AIT.inc. That's www.AIT.inc. So you can learn all about what Fernando's up to right now. And on this episode, we just have a great chat about all these topics. I really think you're going to enjoy it. We absolutely did. And if you are listening to this and you want to get into the real estate world with what we are doing here in the Toronto Golden Horseshoe area, you can find out everything about what we're up to at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. And if you want one of the reports that really breaks down some of the population trends that are happening in this area that most people are completely unaware of and not tuned into, you can check out the reports, including our population report at www.rockstarinnercircle.com forward slash reports. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com forward slash reports. That's it for the intro. Let's get on with the show. Are you ready to live life on your terms? Is it time to take charge? Real estate, business building, the economy, health and nutrition, and more. It's the Your Life, Your Term Show with Tom and Nick Carazza. Are you ready? Let's go. Okay, we are live with uh, my little brother, Nicholas Alexander Carazza. And uh, Fernando Cipriano. But my wife said maybe it's not Cipriano. My wife's Italian. And she said maybe it's... Cipriano. Cipriano. No, I, I just, I guessed. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. No, it is. Well, it is uh, properly pronounced. That is Cipriano. But Cipriano. But Cipriano is how most people pronounce yeah, it. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Uh, anyway, I won't ask more about the last name. Oh. Everyone gets on my case because I ask about everybody's last name. I'm, uh, I have a fascination, obviously, with people's names. But uh, <laughs> so we were talking about the real estate stuff. Yes. Um, what? Yeah, what do you think, you know, prices in Toronto and the prices you know, I guess historically have gone down as you go outside of Toronto. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's just something that continues? Is that old school conventional thinking in a world where maybe work is changing and you can work from anywhere? Like what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, we, we started to discuss this a little bit. And, and when you look at sort of historical understanding of real estate, it was, you know, in Toronto's most expensive as you start moving your way west or even east things started to get less expensive because the logic was, well, you have to now travel into the city to go to work. But we've seen whether, not just in 2020 because of COVID, but generally people are working more and more from home. So, but what I don't think is that that's being reflected in real estate prices. So as you move your way out to Niagara, you'll see that houses are actually very affordable out there. And and my logic has always been, and it's something that's always perplexed me, you know, it's not like land out there is you know, toxic or it's, it's contaminated. And so that's why these properties are cheaper. I mean, the reality is land there is the same land that we stand on here. And yet for whatever reason, the houses are at a fraction of the price. So I really believe at some point in the future, there's going to be a convergence where you're not going to see these big swings in different prices. And so I think there's an opportunity there, you know, because I've been in capital markets my entire career, you look for, you know, let's call them arbitrage arbitrage opportunities where you see an asset that's trading at a price that it should be trading at higher. And so you look for these, you can call it value, you can call it whatever it is. And so when I look at these things, I say to myself, there has to be a point in time when, 
you know, prices in the West have to start getting closer to prices closer to Toronto because people are working from home. So I, I do think that that's my view. I don't know if that actually is going to play out. You but, have no <laughs> idea the view you just expressed and how in sync it is with yeah. our view. That's a chart that Nick put together for one of our economic updates. And in the middle of the chart, I know if you're watching the video, we don't, we're not sure you're not seeing this chart, but the price is an average purchase price of a three bedroom home in Toronto circled in the middle at $1.5 mm. $1. million. And then we take the prices as you go out on the left-hand side, it goes Mississauga, Oakville, Burlington, Hamilton, Kitchener, Cambridge, Waterloo, St. Catharines. And then what Nick noticed over the last few years is pr property prices really drop off when you get to Hamilton. But rents don't drop off. Mm, interesting. So you can pick up these ads. <clears throat> to your point, there's this weird drop off like, oh, you know, it comes right, it comes off. But the property, if the property prices are down by Nick, what, I don't know what the difference is from. Like, and these, in that example, it's 62%. I mean, that, this was just, this was like a rough pull of data sure. from the board. But it was a 62% drop in the, in the price, but it was only a 16%. Uh, sorry, it was a 38% drop in price and a 16% drop in rent. Wow. So all of a sudden, then the, 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 you know, the cash, the cash flow numbers all of a sudden start changing. They your make yield, a lot more sense, right? Your yield and, starts going up. Yeah. And you're, you're 10 minutes for it. You know, if someone like if I'm investing here, I live in Oakville and if I was going to look at Burlington or Hamilton for me, what's the extra 10 minutes for, for those, ty that type of change, it's an, it's worth the drive down the highway. Absolutely. And you know, let me give you an analogy that I think is even easier to understand if you don't, you know, understand cap rates and yield and all of this is I always say that if, let's say you had a, a job that, that could be performed anywhere. Let's say you were a school teacher. The reality is, whether you're a school teacher in Toronto or a school teacher in Thunder Bay, you're getting paid roughly the same amount, but you're much wealthier in Thunder Bay because the cost of living is so much less. So here you have a job, if you're a firefighter, they pay firefighters roughly the same. There may be a little difference, but if you're a firefighter or a cop or a teacher and you're working in Northern Ontario, Everything else is cheaper, but your salary is the same. I, I, I have a friend that I went to school with to, to this point who were, they, they, it, was, it was a couple, they were both from Sarnia. And um, when after school was done, they stayed in Toronto for a while and, and they enjoyed it. They loved it, right? It was, it was great. You're downtown and you know, you're, you're hanging out, you're going to bars and stuff. And then when they were getting, maybe it was after they got married or when they were about to get married and, and they were looking at starting a family, they decided to go back to Sarnia. He was a teacher. She was a nurse. And to them, it was just, it was a no brainer to exactly to your point. They're like, look, we're going to make the exact same amount of money exactly. or roughly the same amount of money. And it just goes way further in Sarnia than it does in downtown Toronto. And that's what you're saying about this data is you're saying if you buy a property in, you know, the West and you're commanding similar rental rates, but your dollar to buy it is less, your return is higher. And people have thought we, we were crazy for that. For 10 years, no, people have been telling us, we were talking about Hamilton, and I know you're very uh, familiar with Hamilton, yes. but we were telling people from Toronto, there's this place called Hamilton, Ontario. Right. And they were like, are you insane? Yeah, because when you drive a, over the QEW, you drive over the, the, the bridge and you see the steel plants, you're like, who the hell wants but, to be right, Hamilton? But then I have another point on this whole matter, because you said Thunder Bay. What happens with technology where jobs now, you're not competing against somebody in Thunder Bay, that the school teacher example, if they're teaching through remote stuff, you can be replaced by a school teacher in the Czech Republic. Sure. What what is this the deflationary aspect on incomes? Like you know, inflation exists and definitely in, in property prices prices are going up. But but are incomes being kind of kept a, a deflationary force on them because jobs are just now competing we're competing globally for everything? Like and, and is COVID a little bit accelerated that do you think because now, if a corporation says, well, you know, my employees were in downtown Toronto, downtown Vancouver, now they can work from home. Well, isn't the next logical step that if Nick Karadza was a top employee, but he doesn't live in Toronto, but he lives in Poland, mm -hmm. can I just hire the Polish Nick Karadza and pay him whatever half the, the amount I would pay him here? And then so... They're already doing what, that. No, I know they're already doing that, but is this now just accelerating yeah, this? Sure. But, yeah. Sorry, I, I, I want to hear, I just mean like companies like Facebook have said, if you move out of the Bay Area, they're going to cut your salary, right? Agreed. But yeah, so I'm uh, sorry, but, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, but I, I think there, there's, it, it sounds almost as though they're doing something negative to the employee. But the reality is, if you asked a lot of people working in Toronto right now, commuting to Toronto, if you said, would you be willing to take a 10% pay cut to work from home? I mean, you've got time that you're saving. You've got money that you're saving. A lot of people might take you up on that offer. So it's not so negative, but in, in, you make a very good point, Tom. The, the question is, is this happening? It's happened in, in, um, in customer service, like call centers, 
where we see people calling us from other countries that we think we're dealing with someone in our own country. So it's already happening there. But you're right. You, this might, whether it's COVID or other things, whether it's, you know, the advent of Zoom and all of this, it might accelerate this whole thing in other industries outside of just the call centers. And if this trend then continues, does the importance of, uh, like, I know I'm going to extrapolate this out way too far, but doesn't the importance of the nation state change? Because if I'm a big corporation and my employees are so scattered around the world, and now it's not just open to the big global companies that had factories in China and were running operations in America, and they almost didn't care about local governments anyway. They were just moving the revenue to where the best tax advantages and efficiencies were. But now this is open to also small and medium-sized companies too. Because of Zoom and the way technology is, every company can almost take advantage of a global workforce. And if that's the case, then really, you know, what impact does the government have to attract new business to its area anymore? Is it just factories and manufacturing that people are going to be after? Like, how do you attract skilled labor to your city when it's just global? Like, it's... It, and I, and I don't really have a good question here. It's almost just like, That's there deep. Seems to, it seems to be like there we're in this weird transitionary period where things are, are not going to be the same 30 years from now than they are today. And that 30 years might seem a long way, but for your son, who's 18, right? Mm -hmm. That's his, he's going to be in the prime of his life. Right. And it seems like there's a lot of big trends that are going to change. Or do you think what I'm kind of brainstorming out? And I know it's not a really coherent thought yet. Does it just sound crazy? <laughs> I, what do you think? Man? Well, for me, I, I think it's already happened. Like you've already seen it happen. So if you look at places and it's not like early on where things kind of migrated to were waterways, where the railroad roads were, things like that, right? Because you needed that infrastructure for the manufacturing. So people naturally set up shop in those types of places. But we've already removed ourselves from that entirely and gone to other kind of areas. And what I mean by that is like, if you look at the Bay Area for, for tech, the reason that exploded the way it did was, yes, it's a decent location too, right? But it's because the industry that was kind of, it's just like the, the um, not necessarily the industry, it's just the environment that kind of was created there. And if you look at, let's say Houston, Houston's a really popular place right now for people to move to. What did Houston really bring? The reason it's popular right now is because of just, it wasn't the government that was attracting people there. It's the people that it, are there. It's the people that were there. So I think we've already passed, passed that. that first thing. Now we're in stage one of it, and then I don't know what stage two and, holds. And I think that's what extrapolates further, that pockets of people are going to attract like-minded yeah. people to that area. And it's not so much going to be the government policies that attract people to a country anymore. It's going to be the quality of the people in that area. Which I guess is sounding like you're, you're nodding like it's just an obvious kind of conclusion. No, I think it makes sense. I just don't know what the next stage of that is because yeah. we're seeing it now and you're saying extrapolated out 30 years and I'm trying to in my head and I haven't quite figured it out that I guess maybe the reason I'm holding back and I, I don't know what you, you think, but it's, it's because I think that's, it, you know, for the people that can with the means to go there, it can be a positive thing. But for the people without the me, it's, it's, it's just widening the gap. the gap. That's the problem, I think. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I think that we are in a transitional stage. Uh, I don't know how long that can last for, but we're seeing, you know, to, to extrapolate this even further, we're seeing sort of a, a, a stay-at-home mentality with work, but also with, with everything else. So you, you look at our own children, you yourself have an 18-year-old son, and and you know these are these are you know young this generation is used to ordering food in uber eats like you know they're they're used to ordering amazon packages coming to the coming to the door uh, the amazon thing to me has been the most incredible uh, the, the most incredible creation this this idea of of amazon because it, it actually conflicts with everything we grew up with the idea of and what i mean by that is that you know when we were growing up the idea of convenience came at a cost. And what I mean by that is that if you wanted to order a pizza and get it delivered to your house, it cost you more money than if you were willing to go pick it up. It was always cheaper to pick up. And the reason for that, their logic was, well, we don't have to send a driver there, that we don't have to pay that driver. If you want to come and pick it up, it's cheaper. You know, if you cut your own grass, it's cheaper than if you hire a landscaper to come and cut it for you. So convenience always came with an added cost. And then suddenly Jeff Bezos came out and said, I've got a great idea. We're going to deliver things to your house, the very same things you could buy at a shopping mall, but we're going to deliver them to you cheaper. And this, to me, just changed the whole thing because now you're, you know, you're thinking, why on Christmas, during Christmas, am I going to drive to a shopping mall and park a kilometer away because this parking lot is full? 
walk in. Now I'm wearing my coat. I'm sweating in this shopping mall. You're also wearing your mask. And you're wearing your mask in a COVID (laughs) world. To to get in line and buy the very same things. I could order online and have it delivered tomorrow to my house for cheaper. So I just think this idea that you're you're talking about, you could extrapolate it even further and say, yeah, I think we're going to see a radically different world in the future where you're going to have people working from home, living, you know, staying at home, you know, yeah, I, don't not know what, leaving home. I don't know what that <laughs> means from a e- social there's perspective. E- there's esports teams exactly. where you can be a master esports yes. player in the basement yes. of your house. And right. Yes. And even look at social media. I've said, you know, our children have more contacts than we ever did, but I argue less friends. See, growing up, I had my, my group of friends and today, you know, I remember one time my daughter threw a party at my house and a hundred people showed up and I said, where, you, how do you, you know? Were, you were happy that day? No, I was delighted. I was delighted. And I said to her, how do you even know a hundred people? She said, well, just from social media, right? And I said, when I was growing up, there was two high schools in Milton where I grew up. I didn't know anyone from the other high school. Today, our kids have friends from different cities, different high schools, different, you know, and that's What high different. school did you go to? Do? EC Drury. Okay. And Got Milton it. District High School was the only other high school. Today, there's a third one there, I think. But, um, but back then, Milton District, I didn't know any of the kids there. And yet we were a small town. So um, I just think, yeah, the, this this idea and going back to real estate, I think it's going to change a lot of things. It's I, I, I'm kind of excited because it's a fa- it feels like a fascinating time. But then I always think I'm sure everyone at this age in their life, you know, I'm 47 turning 48 soon. I'm sure everyone at this age in their life is thinking this is a fascinating time mm-hmm. because every generation has that moment where there's sure. a lot of changes happening, but this time it seems really cool. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, to your point, I'm curious what to the, the mental um, fitness aspect of that and how that's going to kind of impact people. Because when, when you're just kind of so low at home, and I know for me personally, and it could just be my personality type, but very early on, even when I was working from home for large chunks of time, and this was even probably even before we had kids, so I was at home alone at my office. It was in the basement and I would, come up for air finally at, you know, 1, 2 p.m. And I'd go outside and be like, oh my God, like I just feel like such a hermit. Yeah. And I'm hearing it from more people now that they're, now that they've been working for at home for a prolonged period of time, they're like, yeah, it kind of isn't like, it's not all that it was cracked up to be mm-hmm. earlier for them. I think there's a kind of balance there. And I'm curious to see how that plays out because I don't think we've seen the impact of that yet. And I I, I think the social aspect, because as humans, we're naturally, we're, we need some social interactions and we're, we're, we need those people. And I don't feel like it's, the the interactions to your point too about the relationships it doesn't the brain doesn't kind of uh, interact the same way electronically as it does you know um in person and and that's proven through studies with the pausing of of people speaking back to you and just the screen and stuff like that so i think there's just something missing that's going to impact people in the long run but i i'm not a scientist i don't you know be interesting to talk to someone about that but i don't have any data around it yeah, sometimes I wonder if that's because that's our context, because we have a context of pre-internet where you go out and you make social interactions. But when I see some of Aiden's friends who basically seem to play video games like we did, but because they get the social interaction because they're chatting with people on their headphones, they seem to be very comfortable to not go out on a Friday night or Saturday night. Like Whereas as soon as I was able to get my license, got my license because right. I wanted freedom. And then when you have that freedom, even if you had nowhere to go, you went out with your friends. Whereas now I find, and maybe it's just his circle of friends, a lot of them on Friday night, it's like, well, we're all kind of hanging out on a group chat thing and we're playing, I don't know, Fortnite or whatever it is that they're playing. And so they don't even have the context to think it's enjoyable to go out. So in their world, they don't need to come up for air because they don't even know what coming up for air is, is feels like. And, and I, I'm just throwing that out no, there, to right? Your I, point. I don't know. A few months ago, because my son who turned 16 last year and and he didn't get his license and he only got his license like this year at 17 simply because I was pushing him. And I was really curious about this because none of his friends had it either. And I said, when we were 16, you counted down the days to get your driver's license. And so I did some research on it and believe it or not, there are fewer and fewer kids at 16 getting their license than they were when we were young, like a fraction of them. And so I think it's to your point. Alex, when did you get your license? Was it le- 23. 23? There you go. 23. I, I, when we were younger, there you wouldn't have found a person at 23 without a driver's license. Because no. it, it, it signified freedom. Yeah. And nowadays, it's very different. So anyway. Yeah, because the people that I knew that waited until 18 or 19 before they finally went, everyone was looking at them like, what is wrong, right. with, wrong you? with you? It was completely abnormal. Right. Well, now that's not. It, it clearly isn't. 
So from your perspective, working in capital markets, your I don't want to say your whole life, but a big chunk of your mm -hmm. life, when you look at the Canadian real estate market on a whole mm -hmm. and you see price points the way they are and things selling, what comes to mind for someone like you? Because Nick and I, you know, we study the interest rates. We look at debt levels. We mm -hmm. have all these thoughts, immigration levels here in Canada and population growth. But so, someone from your perspective, what, what do you think? Like, what's the conversation you have in your mind when you just see real estate in right. Canada and specifically in Toronto? What comes to mind? You know, I, 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 I love real estate. I, you know, despite the fact that I spent my entire career in capital markets, I love real estate and specifically Canadian real estate. Now, is it expensive? Yes. Um, but I think what's unique about Canadian real estate versus other countries, specifically the U.S., is that there's, 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 less speculation in Canadian real estate than there is in the U.S. And largely because our banks, our banks are very, uh, they're, they're so disciplined. Hard they're they're hard so, uh, that's, a, that's a better way of saying it. But <laughs> they're so disciplined in their lending that it makes it very difficult to borrow money from the banks. So, you know, in the 2008 credit crisis, you saw states in the U.S. where prices fell off by 60%. Florida, Arizona, Nevada, California. Price, real estate prices fell off uh, fell out simply because people were speculating in the U.S. So because U.S. banks are, are so free and so liberal with lending money out, you could borrow money with very little income or no income. They'll give you 100% you know, loan-to-value ratios. In other words, they'll lend you 100% of the value of the house with you putting zero down. And so in the U.S., you had people buying four, five, six houses at a time. So when the market started to turn, you had all this inventory flooding the market because everyone had to sell. That caused a collapse. In Canada, yes, you see this acceleration of prices that I think is Crazy. unbelievable. I don't yeah. think our kids are going to be able to afford houses. But the good news is Canadians are moving into those houses and they're living there. So yes, you know they, they are probably paying more of their monthly incomes towards mortgage interest and principal, but they're not going to be dumping it because the market starts to soften. So it gives more stability in the Canadian market. Um, however... I still think that that prices are running incredibly hot. Now, what most people will argue is it's because interest rates are so low. Mm -hmm. And I say, yes, that does uh, contribute to a lot of this. But in the end, I always say one thing. You know, the only way to pay for your mortgage is with your salary, with your income that you earn. And when you look at real estate in Canada, it's gone up, let's call it in the last 10 years. You guys would know this better than I would, but at least twice, maybe two and a half times over yes. the last 10 years. Yes. And what I say is, have salaries gone up two and a half times? And if the answer is no, well, then the only other way that you could afford that is because interest rates have come down. But interest rates have not come down enough to justify a two and a half time lift in real estate. So what's my view? I don't know. I think that you may find over um, you know, the next three, four, five years, we're going to start to hit a plateau you're not going to see prices fall off, I don't think, like you ever did in the U.S. Because, like I said, people are living there. They're not speculating. They're not buying, you know, three, four, five houses at a time. The only way, I guess, that we would think that it's continued this far, because we agree on the income thing completely. We've pulled Stats Canada data from 1969 oh, and ran yeah. it against asset price. It's stuff. scary to it, see it. it, it, yeah. it it's scary. Actually, I'm going to put up a chart for Fernando yeah. to see. But... Uh, Part of the way it's getting away or it's been able to succeed so far is that people are buying less square footage. Mm. So they're, sal you know, they're, they're spending more even, but mm -hmm. they're even getting way less for what they're spending. So the, they're living in smaller spaces. And because of that, instead, you know, instead of paying whatever percent of their salary on, 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 um, on uh, their primary place of residence, they're paying the same amount or more than 10 or 15 years ago. But if they're paying 10 or 15 percent more than they were paying 10 or 15 years ago in their in their rent or their mortgage payment, they're getting like half I see. the square footage. And I don't know if that can continue because you keep doing that. You're going to be living in a sure. two square foot. Right? Although you look but, at Europe and, and yeah, square footages in Europe it's, it's are very same, different than yeah, North yeah, yeah. America. It's the same kind of idea. I mean, but, people live but in. But we believe it has to plateau at some point, too. And the best theory we can come up so far with with this area is that it will it's got a plateau from what it's going, what's going on now, but the long-term plateau for this area would be when you can't stuff more humans into the space. Mm. So like Rome, you can't really stuff more people into Rome, right? They're not building the big, tall condos. Right. So there's, you know, you, and, and when you can't stuff more people into the Rome, the property prices, and I don't know Rome's real estate, um, really well. Um, but I would imagine it, it hasn't, you know, it's not going like Canadian real estate. Mm -hmm. And it's because you can't jam more people in there. So when we get this Golden Horseshoe area kind of packed to whatever capacity is, the long-term game will be done. 
Mm-hmm. I, I, just, I, I think. It, it, the only question, the thing that freaks me out about that, because it makes sense, except global cities are the density of global cities is so high that means that we, we have a hundred years we can pack a way more like because i'll never forget when i went to cairo and it it, it is a very dense city globally I, I put this up here i want you guys to see this in a sec but i cairo is a very dense city globally but compared to some other cities it's not that dense and when i went there it felt like you could get rid of half the people in the city and it would still be di- like multiples of what toronto was like it was crazy well defenders of toronto real estate will say you look at Hong Kong prices, New York prices, and we're still not there. So no. that's so, to your point. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. Th- this is just something that I saw today. This is from RBC. It's the monthly mortgage premium on an average house in Canada. You can see that we're actually... So to your point, what you were talking about, the lower interest rates, is the interest rates have brought us... Because of the drop in interest rates, we've gone back to about the 2018 level of, of what it... You know, the monthly payment. Mm. That's average across Canada. So you yep. can't really... You know, it's not really... But it just, it's just interesting to see how, how interest rates... That is the driving factor. And then every time that happens people then will be like, oh, now I can afford something. Mm-hmm. And they go out and buy and it drives prices up again. And I mean, there's a very real shot that interest rates are going lower, which well, they're that, not going that, higher. Yeah. So and I think that can add a little bit of fuel to the fire, too. It's as insane as it I, seems. When you said that, I just flashed to eight and mm-hmm. the artificial intelligence. I just mm-hmm. wonder how, how, you know, anyway. I don't have enough smarts to figure out what the AI is yeah. going to figure out, but the inputs that it must be taking sure. in anyway, that we'll, we'll save that discussion for, for a little bit, but yeah, Nick, you're right. Cause it's, it's just crazy. One final thing I'll just say yeah. about the real estate is that the other issue that we have is that most Canadians um, have not experienced a downturn in real estate in Canada since 1996 real estate's just gone up. Oh. Yeah, we had a little bit of a slowdown in 2008 and then another one in 2017 when the foreign tax but came out. But nothing like 90 to 96. But understand, from 89 to 96, people may not know this, but... People th- lost their prices, houses. Prices fell by 30% during that time, in that seven-year period. So it can happen even in Canada. Now, it was a different world because central the central bank in Canada didn't monitor interest rates the same way they do now. They would never let what's happened in the 80s where you had you know, interest rates of 18, 19%, that would never happen today. Well, mathematically, it's just, I think, impossible for them There's to too do much it. debt. It's just too much right. debt. government debt for that to but, happen. Yeah. But you're right, no one has experienced that. Right, they haven't. Because it's been, you know, since 96, it's been, what, 25 years now. So if you haven't owned a house, uh, you know, before 25 years ago, you've never experienced a decline. And it was a six-year decline. Yes, like it went yes. on, it went every yes. year. We did some analysis on it, and because, you know, we were, we were like, holy smokes, what happens to real estate transactions in that world? And it's really weird. Transa- real estate transactions dropped by 50% from 89 to 90, or like 90 to 91. I can't remember which one year period mm-hmm. it is, but it dropped by 50%, which wow. is obviously massive. But then even though property prices continue to drop for another five years, real estate transactions came right back to the regular level. And the reason is when I was talking to our father about it is that, you know, he had friends and I was about 17 then. I can't remember if we told you that our family almost lost everything in that crash. No, I don't. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Our father was flipping properties in Mississauga. Wow. We, he had us leveraged up pretty high and it got ugly. He bought a home at Mississauga Road in Eglinton for 750000 Back four, then. F- yeah. That's four months later, money. it went to four fifty. Wow. Bank was calling it due. Disaster. We wow. almost lost it all. So yeah, you're you're we agree with you 100. Mm. percent But uh, what I was going to say on that was that transactions fell by 50. percent But then a year later, even though property prices continued down for five years, transactions came right back. Interesting. And the reason was people thought it was going to get worse, mm. so they were selling because they were like, next year it's going to be worse. It was a self fulfilling prophecy, sure. right? So people were selling. So if if you can be smart enough in a five six year window to pickpocket your opportunities you might be able to pick up some real estate in a down market and sure. really do well, but you have to have the guts to do it because the banks aren't going to be lending very easily right. and everyone's going to be telling you not to do it. But uh, fascinating stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, It'd be interesting to find someone. We've got to track someone down who, who did well during that period and was able to pick up something. Just yeah. I've just been curious to see how it played yeah, out I'd for that. I'd be curious too because I don't really know any. I, no, I don't know. We met that one. We met a gentleman, older gentleman, remember? Who Came in said, the rusted why would you event? ever sell anything? Was that that guy in the no, rusted, no, the rusted minivan no, with don't, the hat I don't and the know. jeans? No, I might not remember. He came this guy. to our old office and he said, "Why are why do you guys sell some properties?" And we're like, "Well, you know, sometimes you rejuggle your portfolio and you're you're gonna sell some properties." He goes, "Well, you know what? I started buying properties in the early '80s, and by the late '80s, everyone told me to sell, and I didn't sell. And then the early '90s, everyone told me to sell, and I didn't sell. And then the late '90s in the tech run, everyone told me to sell. Then when the tech crash came, everyone told me to sell. And he goes, you know what? Me and my wife, we just went there, we cleaned the carpets, and we painted, and we just kept them all. And he had wasn't he have like twenty properties in Richmond? It was, some, it was in something Richmond like that. Hill. Yeah. 
yeah. all paid off. And back, this would be like 10 years ago, he told us his monthly free cash flow was something like 21000 a month. Wow. On just, just rental properties. So I guess there's something, to, someone did make money through that period because they just bought early and then held right through it and you know, survived. A, a person once said to me, and it was such a, a profound statement. Um, I think I asked them, do you, it was a person that, that owned a lot of real estate. And I said, do you regret any property you've sold, whether it's, you know, second vacation homes, that's that. And the person said to me, I regret every single property I've ever sold <laughs> because I should have kept them all. And, and that's true, right? If you really think about it, even if you reflect it in yourself, every single thing you've ever sold, chances are you would have probably been better off just keeping it totally. if, if you could afford it, right? Totally. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. that, well, any, almost any financial asset. You yeah, know, and I know there's true. some companies that, you know, that's like true. they had, they just kind of went belly up. That That's, that's well, different. But we have the Nortel example. Yeah. 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 So there's th those types of examples. But if you look at, you know, outside of that, because of what's happened with the kind of influx in, in, in uh, government money. Yes. I mean, it's gone into all these financial assets. Yes, so exactly. you were in capital markets, the same type of thing. You just held on to just those. Well, and, and you know what? Amazon, remember Amazon, you brought up Amazon. Amazon mm -hmm. in the early 2000s, like remember in the early 2000s? Yeah. People were, people like, were like, what is this? Is it is ever going to make money? Garbage. It just loses money. Right. Garbage. And I'm sure some people bought and sold. And now you look back, you're like, what did I do on Amazon? Why did I sell that thing? Exactly. But, uh, okay, so the next thing I wanted to just uh, get your thoughts on. If I say the word debt, whether it comes to Canada or the U.S. or the world, what just comes to mind? You don't have to have like an answer on any debt. Sure. Just what, what, what word associate? Like, what, what do you think of when I say that? I, I, I want to say the word um, like illusion. And, and what I mean by that is that we are, we are holding this economy together because the governments have spent all this money to give to people. In Canada, it's CERB, in the U.S., it's stimulus packages, et cetera. But to me, it's a way that the government you know, acts to try and say, don't pay attention to what's happening. We got to protect this economy, hoping that you know, they can keep it going just until it gets back on its feet. So I'm not suggesting that we're going to, I mean, we're already in a recession. I mean, if you look at from the technical perspective, two quarters of declining GDP means you're in a recession. But I'm saying practically, we're not seeing the recession because the governments have spent all this money to make us feel like everything's still okay. I don't know when those you know chickens come home to roost. I don't know what happens when the tap gets turned off because you know it's it's almost like you know if if our children move out but we keep paying their rent payments and their utility bills, they get the mistaken impression that they're being grown ups. But at some point, you got to say, okay, well, I'm going to stop doing that now. Are you okay on your own? And if the economy can't get back. And I, I keep saying things like, you know, look at restaurants. I mean, the restaurant industry is tough on its own. When you start saying you can only have half your patrons or they can only sit on a patio, that may work in the summer when it's warm. What happens in February when the patios shut down? You know, when you look at hospitality or tourism, all these people that work in hotels and airlines and, you know, all these areas, they're going to be dramatically hurt. We don't see it now because the government's covering the bills. So that's a long way of saying you. I hope you didn't ask me for one word. No, no, uh, illusion. Debt. Illusions are very good words. It just feels like a magician that says, you know, don't pay attention to what's happening over here. I'm going to, to you know. the, the, the The cracks are starting to show in that illusion because, you know, Starbucks downtown Oakville. Like they were talking about downtown Oakville. Starbucks just closed yeah. permanently. Yeah, it's and, unusual to see a Starbucks close around yeah. here. And, and Hudson's Bay, I, I think some of the landlords that Hudson's Bay rents for is now coming after Hudson's Bay for non-payment of rent. Starbucks, I'm sure, did not make its last few rent payments. I have no proof of this. I am sure Starbucks did not make its last two or three months rent payments well, in the downtown Oakville location. Well, and they just bailed. So so there are some cracks that just have not been kind of sewn into the store yet. And six months from now, we might finally see some of those. Well, I was talking to one of our investors who owns some commercial properties. And um, he said he said a number of his tenants are have already told him that they're basically on the brink. Like... One was a yoga studio that uh, I forget where it was, but for whatever regulations, she uh, maybe the size of it, she could have six or eight people in it. And she's like, it doesn't even, like she didn't even open up because she's like, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense for me to open to your point about the capacity because it's going to cost me more to run it than the income I'm, I'm able to bring in because of what they're doing. So, so he's just expecting it, you know, to 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 happen. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not going to be pretty. I've been I've been saying we're in the eye of the storm, but I feel like I've been saying that for the eye of the storm for, seems pretty long. Yeah, right? I just feel like I've been saying it for a long time, but I, I just don't see how we don't come out the other 
side of this without seeing some serious destruction happening. I, I thought we were in the eye in the storm in 2015. Mm. Yeah. You know, and I, so it seems like we're still in this eye of the storm thing. But uh, okay, so then the next word I want to throw out to you is with all of this going on and what you know of the world and, you know, you have some exposure to artificial intelligence, of course, and your history in the financial markets. What do you, when I say opportunity, what, what comes to mind for you for that? What do you, and I'm just, I'm sideswiping you with this. I've given you no prep on, yeah, on no this. So, yeah, sorry. That's but just okay. what's the first thing that comes to mind? Like when you think of opportunity for your kids, your family, your business, your future, whatever it is. You know, I, I, I certainly, um, you know, when it comes to opportunity, um, my sense is that I don't know, for example, if someone were to say, where would you invest right now? Right? Right now I'm a little bit unsure because of everything that's going on. So to me, the, the word that I often use to me is the most valuable word that I would use right now is liquidity. If you have some dry powder, as we call it in, in private equity, in other words, the ability to act when a true opportunity presents itself. The question is, I don't know when that's going to happen. Um, so, you know, for example, if because interest rates are so low, I'm, I'm talking about business owners now. If you can try and, you know, refinance things, try to create some liquidity just to be prepared for something. I'm not say hope for a, a dramatic downturn in the economy or people getting sure. you know affected negatively, but I do believe that at some point in the not too distant future, there are going to see, be some incredible opportunities, whether that's in real estate or it's in, you know, if you want to collect other things, artwork, or there's going to be a need. This happened in 2008 during the credit crisis. We didn't quite see it in Canada, but in the rest of the world, you had opportunities to buy vacation properties. Cars, you know, exotic cars. Some Canadians artwork. took advantage of it in Florida. Exactly. Right? Our the dollar was Our dollar par. went to par. Exactly. Yeah. So so your question is, unfortunately, it's almost like there's a, a I, I can only give a pause answer. In other words, yes, opportunity will be there. I just don't know right now where it is. But if you could just, you know, cobble together some liquidity just to be prepared. That's a good, you know, we, we tell a lot of our investors, while the banks are willing to give you a refinance or a credit line on some of your income properties. Take it. Take it. Okay, Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for yeah the, reiterating that point because we're telling them, take it. Yes. Do the refinance now because in six months, the auditors of the banking sector might say, don't like what the economy looks like. I don't care if you have 800000 in equity in one of your income properties. You know, we, we are not refinancing that puppy. Sorry. So take it now. So that's coming take from Take it your now. Point. Your cost will be the interest, uh, extra interest, but it gives you the, the comfort that you have it available. And if things get fixed and, ne- and you don't need it, just most of these loans are open loans anyway or line of credit, you don't have to draw on it, which is even better. Um, I, I agree with you. Liquidity is, is to me, the most important thing that, that investors should have right now. And then um, when it, we were talking about school, because Aiden's here back from Western and stuff, what do you think we can, you know, from, a, I don't know if it's a style of teaching or what is the thing we can share with our children right now from an education point of view to prepare them? Is it just to be resourceful and resilient, like to give them the character traits to get through anything? Is that more important education than any concept in and of itself? Like, how, how do you think about that? Like, how, you, you know, you, is two kids, right? I, well, I, I have, uh, no, I have five children, oh, five. Uh, but, but, Holy but with shit, a blended I family, a blended that. family, okay, sorry. a blended so five, family, five children. three Congrats. of my own and two step kids. Yes. Wow. And they're all across there. They're all in college or university and. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it just briefly when I came in. And I met Aiden. Um, my son also is at Western, yeah. and we talked about it. That you know, obviously, we're you know, myself a university grad, and, and I enjoyed my time. I do feel that university is a little bit more theoretical and abstract, and I find that a lot of business students they come out of school, and they don't know things like you know mortgaging of a house or you know renting versus mortgages or leases versus car loans or you know budgeting or compound interest compound on, on interest debt on a visa card <laughs> exactly or 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 investing you know um, you know RSPs or RIFs or you know tax free savings account these kinds of things in, in schools aren't teaching at least not not they're starting to do this and in fact I think November is a fiscal literacy month right oh, now so I, I think it is the banks are trying to teach young kids about you know, understanding finances a little bit more. And I'm not saying the world is just about finance. Art's important. And, no, but it gives you and, freedom. I, I think really, if you want personal freedom in your life, you need to have your financial house in some order. Mm-hmm. 
Because to do the best expression of yourself in your own life, you need some freedom to do that. Mm -hmm. If you're kind of locked in a, a nine to five job for your whole life, I don't think your true self can really come out. And I think we all benefit as a society when Nick's true self comes out, when Fernando's true, you know, your yep. true creative spirit in whatever way that's going to express itself. I feel you need financial freedom or you need to, to have freedom for that to... Well, it's a means to an end, right? Instead of just maybe the ambition to just for accumulation, you know, and if you just want many millions because you're just like, well, I was set out a goal to, you know, to have $10 million net worth and I just want $10 million and that's it. Sure. I mean, if that floats your boat, go for it. But, but to your point, I think you were like, there's other things too. It doesn't have to be just about finances to both of you guys, what you, what you were saying, use it as a means to an end. At least that's the way I look at it. Agreed. So um, next thing I want to ask you, we alluded on a little bit. Do you think interest rates, what, what's your projection? Do you think interest rates will be going lower? Like if you just, I know that's just a broad question. Yeah, no, I don't, only because we're running out of room yeah, to go okay. lower. So I mean, I mean if you they go lower, it's a marginal well, lower. Well, you, you look at the prime rate is at 25 basis yeah, points yeah. right now. So, or not the prime rate, the bank rate is yeah. at 25 basis points. So there's only 25 more basis points to go before, and some countries have tried it, um, negative interest rates. We Believe got, it or we not, we got to put a wager on who if we think yeah. we're going negative. In no, this kind of, I yeah. mean, I, the, the, like I said, there are countries that have tried it where they actually pay you to borrow money from. Yeah, them. I think Denmark has right. those mortgages. So I, I don't know. So like I said, the the delta of how much lower it can get, you're just bumping into zero. So um, I don't think they're going to go down, but I don't think they're going to go up either. Um, this whole experience, this whole exercise, and you know, uh, uh, interest rates oh. where they are. Japan, I mean, Japan lowered their rates to zero 30 years ago, and they could never raise them again. And growth is flat. Now, they don't have a, the same immigration that we have. But this this idea of a world with low interest rates, I think this is where we're going to be forever. Because for two reasons. Number one, it would it would cripple the economy by raising rates. And our growth hasn't been strong for the last decade or longer. But more importantly, the governments have all borrowed more money than any of us did. So it's in their best interest to keep interest rates low because then they don't have to pay so much back. So the good news is, you know, we're in it together. I've, I've always thought this was the funniest joke where they say, or not, it's not really a joke, but they say, if you borrow $1,000 from the bank, you're worried. The bank's not. If you borrow a million dollars from the bank, you're both worried because the bank has something to lose also. But if you borrow a billion dollars from the bank, the bank's worried. You're not because... The bank doesn't want to lose it. And if you song. walk away, you're like, yeah, big deal. I'll just start again. So the good news is the governments have borrowed so much money that they're tied to these low interest rates. It's it's really interesting when it seems so obvious to me that we can front run some government decisions. Like mm. we kind of like, sorry, we know you're screwed yeah. and we are going to buy things that are going to benefit from these low rates, which then makes me think, holy shit, are we not seeing the complete picture here? Right. But uh, so, in, okay, in your past life, you've been in the finance, capital markets, finance industry, is yeah. Fair? yeah, finance. Um, you have, a, I'm sure, a lot of contacts in that world and stuff. Why did you choose to go down the AI path with what you're doing now? Because mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of other people are doing things, I don't know, uh, you know, starting different finance companies in, in different spaces. What was it about artificial intelligence that just kind of captured you? Well, because because you were basically retired. Yes. Yes, you know, I was. Living in a nice house here in Oakville. I know you're now abandoning us from Oakville. You're mm. checking out. You're like, forget it. I'm not going to live with these Oakville people. Alex <laughs> lives in Oakville too. Oh, good. So you're, you're all of us. You're so just like, I love the city. It. I'm out of here. I don't no. want to hang out with these people. Not true. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what, uh, yeah, what What pulled you back? Like, why Why was it AI and not something else? All right. Well, you know, it, it's your, your question is almost like a trick question because it wasn't AI that brought me back. Um, so our business is an artificial intelligence company. What is this? Our, you know, AI, or also called machine learning, is the field of trying to make computers think like humans. Now, when I first was introduced to this concept, I said, but I thought computers were smarter than people. And, you know, I was quickly learned that, no, computers are faster at computing things, but computers don't think. So the field of artificial intelligence is trying to you know, write algorithms or language for computers to make them think and learn and be creative and come up with solutions based on you know, past information that they're digesting, which computers never did before. All computers did before was calculate. If it was just looked at it a different way, computers used to be just a more complicated calculator. Calculators don't think. You have to still key things in. So all AI is is, is allowing computers to try and predict outcomes. That's why they study, they learn, and they try and predict an outcome. So let me give you a simple example. The, the most common use of AI is spell check. 
When Spellcheck first came out, it was a dictionary. It would tell you your word was wrong by underlining it. But as the algorithms got smarter, as the computers got smarter, it started to understand the English, English yeah, language grammar. and started to tell you that your grammar was wrong. And then today we have predictive language that says, when you start to type something, it says, I know what you're saying, let me finish it for you. That's algorithms, that's AI getting smarter. Face recognition is when this computer is trying to determine who am I looking at? It's trying to predict who it's looking at. Self-driving cars, um, you know, things like Siri and Alexa when you speak to them. It is about a computer that's learning as it goes. Chatbots, people, whenever you go online, for example, in the middle of the night, and you see someone says, oh, I'm here for you. What question do you have? And I used to always think, is there someone actually working at this hour answering questions? The answer is no. It's AI. It's the illusion of a person, but it's what's called a chat bot. It's a, a robot. And some of them have gotten good. Some of them are still kind of crappy. You're, you're right. Some of them are, right. are decent. They're decent, yeah. right. So so when when I first was introduced to this, this AI concept, it wasn't the AI that drew me. This business, what it was doing was it was building investment portfolios using AI. In other words, getting a computer to pick stocks, let's call it, to oversimplify it. Now, we don't just invest in stocks, but it's stocks, bonds, commodities, currencies, et cetera. But it was building a portfolio. So your, your fund's also buying currencies. Yes, they are. So it was a portfolio of, of these assets that the algorithm was identifying to be winners. And I was skeptical because when you look at the investment universe, mutual funds and things like this, and I'm sure a lot of your, your clients who love real estate, they love it because it's more stable than the markets are generally. Because so it's also a pain in the ass, real estate too, yeah, right? Well, but it is stable and you can't sell it very easily. So you're stuck you're right. with it sometimes. You're right. But yeah, go on, go on. So in my career, mutual funds have always struggled to deliver returns in excess of their benchmarks. What's a benchmark? The TSX 300, for example, is, is the index in Toronto that trades. If you have a Canadian equity fund, you're measured against the TSX 300 to say, how did you do this year? And believe it or not, every single year, 92% of mutual funds fail to beat their benchmarks. So they don't even meet the returns of the index. You should have just bought the index. So that was always my experience. So when I discovered this firm that was doing this AI and beating their relative benchmarks over and over again, I didn't believe it, quite honestly, because you can't beat the, the benchmark. But yet this AI was doing it. So that's why I joined. It wasn't because AI drew me in. It was because the application of AI in the context of investment portfolios, blew me away because it was doing something that, in my experience, it, that had never done. So we've happened. gone from active investment management to passive investing, where everyone's like, forget active management because I'm just going to go into passive funds because passively, you know, it's, it's going to beat everything. But exactly. now we're going. So, so this is interesting. I never looked at your business as this next evolution, but it's almost possible that we're going to the next evolution, which isn't passive investing, which has sucked in. Hundreds and bi billions, hundreds of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, dollars and change the stock market and exactly evaluations right. forever. You're right. But now, I've never looked at your business. That's interesting. This is the evolution of active management. And now it's not humans, <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately, but it's AI that is going to actively place yes. the money. And we're doing it and it's succeeding. And with lower volatility, it's got a quarter of the volatility of the markets. It's beating the market. And we're doing this already. So to use an analogy, I always say, when I was growing up, when we'd drive to Pennsylvania to see my relatives, my father would take out a map and draw the, the, the destination. The old CAA map. Right, yeah. exactly. We didn't know what the traffic was, was going to be like. We didn't know anything like that. And so then when GPS came out, I remember the first car I had with a GPS in it, I had to update it with a CD every year because roads were changing. Milton, for example, was growing. Yeah, roads were being introduced. You had sometimes in the trunk. Exactly. You had to put the CD in there. You had to put the there. CD yeah. in. Today... People use Google Maps. That's AI. Google Maps is AI. What it's telling you is it's a live dynamic GPS that says, get off the highway, go down to Lakeshore, go along Lakeshore, and then get back on the highway because it's telling you traffic patterns, accidents, you know, and so that's AI to make your life so easier. The, 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 if I extrapolate that one out then, so I guess right now, what I, is it fair to consider your business a fund? Is it a fund? It's a it? fund. Okay, so it's a fund. Yes. So, now, so now let me think there's an aspect of your business that's a fund that invests in things. But imagine that the fund can now go back and acquire or even start its own extra company. That Like imagine the fund says there's an opportunity in real estate in this part of the world, I'm going to form a corp <laughs> to buy the real estate. That corp hires property managers 
So now you have AI, it's an identified an opportunity that wasn't just easily, you couldn't purchase it because, you know, it needed to actually form the corporation and hire humans to go acquire property. And it knew that the acquisition of that property was going to be the right thing to do. But you, at the top of the pyramid there, you actually have AI possibly making new corporate structures in the world and deploying capital. Yes. AI will do this and AI does this already in a number of different fields. We just happen to apply it in our field. But AI is being used in other industries as well. When you look at, you know, going back to Amazon, Amazon knows what you're buying, knows what other people like you are buying. It uses AI to try and encourage you to buy other things that you might like. TiVo systems where they tell you, if you like this show, you're going to like this show. That's all AI. It's doing a study of, of your behavior and people like you. And so it's trying to, it's trying to predict what you will likely do in the future. Okay, so you've thought about this then, obviously. 10 years from now, where is it? Where does it? Where, where are we? Forget now, because this is yeah. going to be figured out. Like, I think, let's face it, you're going to figure this out. It sounds like you're already figuring yeah. this out. 10 years from now, where are we? Specifically, our fund or AI in general? You pick. Okay, so AI in general. I, I, I look at, for example, vaccines with what's going on right now with COVID. The traditional way of developing vaccines, which is done very laboriously, scientists working on, you know, AI will... will enter into that picture and start to do studies at, you know, with quantum computing. Because it'll be able to crunch data. It'll but crunch data. the data will still have to be acquired. Yes, but but because using quantum computers, which is like huge computers that run so fast, running millions of simulations, so much faster than could ever be done, it's going to be able to just accelerate the process of, of vaccine development as an example. But there's also this thing about Siri and Alexa. You know, I, I believe that the way AI is moving is that you're going to have personal assistants that will f feel like real personal assistants where, you know, you, you, it's going to be buying groceries for you because it'll know that your your fridge is running low on it. It'll do more than set a reminder. I mean, oh, it'll be a lot more than that. So there's a book by Dan Brown, a, a fictional author, you know, a Da Vinci Code. Everyone knows Da Vinci yeah, yeah. Code. Dan Brown wrote a book called The Origin, and it's a really great book about... Again, it has nothing to do with AI, not really, but but in the book, the protagonist, the, the main character, through the whole time is is dealing with who he believes is a person. He's got this person in his ear all the time, helping him out. You know, when he's in trouble, he's actually saying, you know, you got to run down this hallway. Someone's coming to get you. And only at the end of the book, and I don't want to spoil it, but at the end of the book, do you discover that the the person in his ear was not a real person. It was an AI yeah, no, simulation. You just ruined the book. You just ruined that's the whole not, book. That, that wasn't, I'm joking, I'm that joking. wasn't the premise yeah. of the book. But when I read this, I thought that's AI. Is that we're gonna we're gonna have a time when your car will be you know you don't have to fill your car up with gas because well look at now Tesla as an example. I mean there's no servicing with a Tesla. They update your car. You get updates when you get in your car. And I have a Tesla, but you know you wake up and you'll you'll the the update has happened overnight and your car now is different the next day the the whether it's the interface on this on the screen is different or just the way it drives it'll be different because they've uploaded the the advancement to the car the idea of driving it to a a service center is gone so this is all ai and so i, I just think i don't know what it'll what it'll mean because it's removing a lot of the human interaction which then goes back to our original conversation of what does that mean for you know jobs and pays and all of this in the future? I don't know. Well, I was just looking, thinking about the markets and, and and what you when you were talking about your fund, and I'm like, well, doesn't it cannibalize it slightly because then then all the 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 pros like you know anything that is a good AI algorithm will then start investing in the same types of things. They're not, you know, so it kind of like is similar to what we're seeing in the, with the S and P 500 now that, that really what's driving that market is just a number of, of big stocks there because all the funds are going in there. So then it becomes, then it just becomes like you either find a good AI or a crappy one. Like maybe you think Google home is good or whatever the Google, the Google assistant's good and you think Siri's crap. And then you're just kind of put your money behind the Google home. It's an excellent point. It's an excellent question. And that, that would be assuming that there is one universal answer to a great algorithm. And, and in the end, AI is no different than any other industry. Some people do it better than others. If you like Tim Horton's coffee better than other coffee, it's still coffee, but one you enjoy more than the other. But your point is, if you succeed at what you're trying to do, which we're, we're doing now, 
will not others start to mimic the AI and then eventually if everyone's doing it, it removes the arbitrage opportunity. And the reality is with algorithms, they're very proprietary, they're very secret. You know, we have seven data Thanks scientists. Thanks for giving us yours, by the way, yeah, on the USB Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I that give it to you. That was very kind yeah, of you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. That was very kind of so you. So we at, at eight, our firm, we have seven data scientists that all work in silos. So they all work on elements of the models and the algorithms, but none of them knows the entire algorithm. And that's by design. They all have lifetime uh, it's non-disclosure like the, it's like agreements. It's Coca-Cola secret formula. It is a little bit like that. So, yeah. so as long as, you know, no one can cobble together the entire algorithm that we have, then it just belongs to us. If we find the secret formula, let's call it, to cracking the code of the capital markets and being able to continue to outperform and we don't give it up, then it belongs to us. But over time, you're right. You just, But remember, we don't rest on the existing algorithm. It continuously, day after day, improves. And day after day, we run more simulations to try and find, you know, tweak it and get it better and better. But but that it, risk exists. And, and the efficiencies might just get, like, you, you might just get smaller little kind of people no, I battling got over smaller increases at a faster rate. No, I got that. And that's why I was saying the difference between you kind of pick the one you like. So, like, mm -hmm. if I'm an Apple right. person, I'm like, no, I really like Siri. It's the best. And other people will be like, no, Siri, I can't, I don't want to deal with Siri. I'm an Alexa person. Right. And, and so I, if Alexa is my manager, I'm going to right. invest with my money with Alexa and she'll Or if you're investing thing. for cash flow and dividends versus right. maximum yeah. appreciation. I like how I said she, like Alexa. Yeah. As a person, but anyways, but yeah. but yeah, so I, I get your point, but in some areas, like, so there are some areas, so you talked about the Tesla, right? And the Tesla is like, you're going to have a preference over the Tesla interface and how it does certain things for you versus let's say the BMW comes out with sure. an electro, uh, uh, electric vehicle um, and, and they do that. But when it comes to return on finance and the purpose of a fund, isn't there only one? Because early on you said, well, it depends on if there's one outcome or not. But in that specific industry, there is one outcome. Isn't right. the one outcome only to maximize return? How great is that? I mean, you, you made a great point. If you decide on whether it's Alexa or Siri or Tesla or BMW, those are subjective decisions that you make based on your own desires, your own, uh, you know, you're not being, that's your own subjectivity. In finance, in funds, it's very objective. We only succeed if we deliver returns. And in the end, you're as an investor, you're going to say, can I achieve a better return somewhere else? And if you can, you should take your money out and bring it somewhere else. And so we're in some ways, we're held by a very different standard than a Tesla would mm -hmm. be. Tesla could say, people just love us. And even if we don't quite give the, the ideal experience, people are going to stick with the us brand. because they love, exactly. they love the so brand. So you're very a harsh industry. With us, it is win or lose. And what's great about our fund is, I often say this, we feel so strongly about the success of our fund that we don't lock investors in. If they put their money in, if we don't deliver the returns that we're promising, they take their money out. At any time. At any time with no penalties, no pay, no fees. It's it's free to go in and it's free to get out. So all that does, we, seem, that does seem like a great value proposition to offer people. Right. It also seems scary on your side. Yes and no, because for us, um, these are liquid assets that we're investing in. Unlike real estate, your point earlier was a great one. Real estate's great unless you try to get out in a heartbeat and then you got to wait for it to sell. With securities that we're buying, stocks, bonds, commodities, currencies. These are liquid trillion dollar markets around the world. So the ability to just simply sell them and then give you your money back is very easy for us. So it doesn't cause a big problem other than that we lose a client, which we don't want to lose. The good news is our clients are not leaving because we've delivered exactly what we're saying, which is in this world of uncertainty and with the U.S. election that just happened this week, with COVID, with you know everything whatever's else going on, next. whatever's <laughs> coming next, I often say you want a product that's liquid. And with our fund, not only is it liquid, it's not very volatile. So our fund doesn't go up. You can see up. the passion come out. When you talk about it, you get excited. Yes, so that's, yes. that's cool to see. Okay, so then on a slightly other front, then, and maybe in the investing world, you said in 2008, you know, there was opportunities to buy fine art in Europe, maybe in the U.S. Sure. When is that something now? People, you know, when you're you're you have Italian name, mm -hmm. so gold somehow means something to you in one mm -hmm. way, shape, or form. Do you think there's aside from eight, which would be a very liquid investing mm -hmm. platform to go into, if, if someone wanted to get some something like. Um, gold, or if you consider Bitcoin hard money, yes or no, it all, you know, I'm not trying to argue that, but is now the time, do you think some people should be looking at fine art, gold, possibly Bitcoin, if that's in the same world, is now one of those times to look at that? Or to your point earlier, you don't know, just stay liquid and we don't know when the right time to pick up some of these things is. Because in, in our life, we believe our family lived through the Yugoslavia hyperinflation. Mm. So we always think, hey, 
You should probably have some. some we, we've never been. Yeah, our family, has, you know, we don't we come from pretty modest means. We've never had fine art in our family. Mm-hmm. So it's always been gold. And now to us, it's Bitcoin. I was trying to push you on. Remember, I was mm-hmm. throwing the Bitcoin yeah. book. In, I read yeah, the book. Yeah, it was yeah. a great book. Yeah. So yep. so is, is is do you think there's a place for that in, in someone's life? I think there's a place for every asset in, in a person's life. Whatever the, the, the greatest piece of advice you can give any investor is don't put too many eggs in one basket. And so is now the right time? That I don't know. And, and I didn't mean to sound like a fine art. I don't own fine art. I'm not some elitist who buys fine art. I'm just saying. No, that, but it's a valid thing it, to buy. Like, well, it's, you, it's a valid, I don't know anything about it. Yeah. But we agree that that's the kind of thing that might have opportunity. Sure, there's different yeah. assets out there. And and so so diversifying your, your portfolio is a great idea because the good news about assets like gold or Bitcoin, they're a lot of times uncorrelated to what's happening with the rest of the world. In fact, uh, gold is negatively correlated to what's happening around the world, which is, that's a positive thing. For those that don't know what I mean by that, is gold is considered a fear gauge. That is, when people get scared, they buy gold as a protection. So the good news about having gold, it's like having an insurance policy. You have insurance on your car, and not because you plan to get into a car accident, but in the event that you do, you have something there that's protecting you. And so gold is that. Gold's a great place if you don't know what's going to happen in the world, It's good to have an asset that at times when the world's collapsing, people jump into it so it should go up for you. Bitcoin is another example. I mean, Bitcoin, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the idea of a Bitcoin. But Bitcoin to me, and if you really look at it, it sounds um, almost like such a novel idea. The idea of a brand new currency. It's like a brand new country starting and saying, you know what? I know you're used to the US dollar and the Canadian dollar and the Chinese yuan and but Japanese yuan, <laughs> but you know what? We're creating a new country, and our country is called Bitcoinia, yeah, and yeah. the the currency is called Bitcoin. So that I mean, it's happened before. I mean, we started we started by creating currencies. Originally, the gold standard was used, where you would trade in your gold for pieces of paper. you know paper. So why should we ignore uh, Bitcoin? It's we- interesting though, with your fund, with eight, eight could uh, through different inputs decide that Bitcoin is hard money and it could say, okay, I'm going to collect this. And unlike gold, where you have to take physical possession of the gold, the fund would, if it said, no, no, we need to actually we take, pos- we're not gonna play the price movement on this. We're gonna own this as part of the fund. In the Bitcoin world, eight could decide Bitcoin is hard money. And when it owns it, it freaking owns it. Sure. It's, it doesn't have to take physical delivery of the gold to actually have the possession. It you, owns do you, it. Do you have a name of the AI? Is it 8? That's yeah, the, the, the that's firm it. is called 8AIT. So if you go to the, our website, which is 8.inc. Is there a name of the algorithm? Like, you know how the no, series we, got a name? Yeah, so, no, yeah. we don't what, have a name. What's yours? We don't uh, have a yeah, name. Yeah, we got to come up with a name. Yeah. Maybe it's called Fernando. Yeah, I don't no, know. I, don't I, thought, know. I, thought, I thought 8 was and, it. And, and I'm like, that's a pretty cool name too. And I'm like, why does all, like a series, Alexa, they're kind of, like, why doesn't someone like. We're naming these things Jeff, like humans. Jefferson or something, yeah, yeah, you know, like good. something that's like a multi-syllable thing that just doesn't really flow well. Who's the name of your partner in the business? Muko Paul. And he's the real brains. Maybe it's Muko. Yeah, Muko is the one who designed this algorithm he went to mit and created this algorithm and and um so yeah but back the bitcoin thing you're, it's a valid point what ai could definitely do is to build a fund that that w- of cryptocurrencies it could identify you know trends and behaviors in each of the different cryptocurrencies and as it, they relate to each other it will right? be doing this you oh, will yeah. be yes. doing this so, yeah. so that's for sure can be done where does ai come into play with human behavior because that's the one thing that i don't know you know because ai can predict some things but can they predict that um you know that people are going to riot at a certain time you know i'm just trying to have but the first thing that's coming and i want to come back to your bigger point here but definitely when your apple watch has hrv now and traffic knows what you know it knows what traffic is and it knows what your past sleep history has been and it can look into your calendar we're a moment away where ways or google maps says hey you got a long drive ahead of you tomorrow you know, you go, you're going to London to visit your son. You know, even if the Tesla is going to drive by itself, right, right. You, you got like a couple hour drive. Nick, you know what? Um, that, that You better go home early today because your sleep patterns the last few days combined with the traffic that you're going to sit in tomorrow because your departure times during rush well, hour. it's already there. I mean, it's, it's already there, but it's just not the we're integration. Like a, we're, yeah, we're just a but moment that's, away yes, from it. That's, but yeah, that's your point. like 12 to 24 months totally. away. That's not but a, Nick, yeah. I, I, what you've just said is already happening also. Believe it or not, AI is being used at a lot of security uh, departments in countries where they're trying to identify 
it's a, do you remember the movie Minority Report with Tom Cruise where yeah. they oh, would yeah. they would identify you committing a crime before you committed it? Yeah. Yeah, remember? Yeah. Which is really That's a, awesome, right? It's You're an interesting, arrested. You are yeah, guilty. There, there's a real there's a real ethical issue there, right? Like how do you arrest someone before they commit a crime? But the idea of what know. they're using. They, we, we've all put in our homes before right. we got any kind of COVID. Sorry, yeah, I'm not going to get off okay, travel. I won't get off travel. Let's that's a controversial that subject. <laughs> but back to, to your point of this, AI is being used to try and identify terrorist threats before they happen. So AI is, is studying social, social media um, uh, yeah, feeds. Yeah, yeah. And if they see certain words that are appearing, because they have a profile of what you know, t- terrorist sub- suspects look like or act like, they start to try and figure out where these words are pro- yeah, popping d- up so they could, ad- in advance, before they get radicalized, they can step in. Now imagine that. I mean, that's where we are. So so this minority report idea is not that no. far off. Where well, now during, you're- during the Bush era, they were they called it chatter, right? They're right. like, oh yeah, increased There's chatter. chatter. Right, exactly. in the, in the ter- and they, they thought that a, an attack somewhere might right. be imminent or whatever. But right. that, was the, that was that term. And they were throwing that around to to be able to invade countries now whatever, the chatter whatever can, they did. The chatter can just be processed at such right. a rate. Yeah, exactly. Right. No, well, uh, Fernando, if someone wants to find more about you, the fund, the, the URL to go to is... Yeah. 8.inc, which is A-I-T dot I-N-C. Yeah, cool. Yeah. We could talk a lot more about a lot of different things. So I, I really appreciate this. Always love chatting yes. with you. Thank you for coming in. You didn't have to do this, so My we're pleasure. really appreciative. Thank really you. really enjoyed it. Hey everyone, it's Tom Kradz again. So hopefully you enjoyed that edition of the Your Life, Your Term show with Fernando Cipriano. Remember, you can check out all about him and his investment fund at www.ait.inc. We're not connected to them in any way. Always do your due diligence. Check this stuff out for yourself. Never trust anything anyone tells you, including us. So if you do want to check uh, check him out and more about him, though, you can go to www.ait.inc. And if you are listening to this and you want some real estate information, but you don't know where to start or where to look, especially when it comes to the greater Toronto and Golden Horseshoe area, you can get access to all the reports we put out, including one of the population reports that summarizes a lot of the data that we look at for the basis of some of the fundamentals that drive this real estate market here in this area. You can get that report at www.rockstarinnercircle.com forward slash reports. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com forward slash reports. That's it for this episode. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Until next time, your life, your terms.